And so he starts using um, all different types of these forms and these uh, all natural glazes. And that's the birth of Edgefield pottery. Pottery as an industry came to Edgefield County in the early 1800s. Dr. Abner Landrum saw a need for mass produced pottery after President Thomas Jefferson embargoed British goods to encourage the start of the American industry. Tanya Guy, archivist and historian in Edgefield, says he built a town called Pottersville using slave labor to run the business. That, that was big business. To be able to make pottery right here and sell it locally instead of having to import it from England. Um, and they were still importing it, and you still get your finer, like Wedgwood pottery, but for your everyday wear, for utilitarian wear, for your plantations, you were getting the Edgefield pottery. Edgefield pottery is known for being very large, durable stoneware pots and jugs. Tanya's husband, Justin Guy, is a master potter who recently won the prestigious Jean Laney Harris Folk Heritage Award for his work. He says the stoneware made in Edgefield was mostly used for storage. These items were made out of necessity. This is how you survived through the winter. You stored your meat and vegetables in the jars, uh, put paraffin or put cheesecloth across the top, tied the cheesecloth around this little rim, and then paraffin wax gives you an uh, airtight seal. As the Landrum pottery industry became more successful, more people wanted to capitalize on it. But the families who owned the potteries were very secretive about how it was done. That's how the clay clans were born. Uh, again, if you wanted to, to come down like, like Thomas Chandler and you wanted to learn how to make Edgefield pottery, you had to marry into the families in order to gain the, the access to those recipes, which were very, very protected. So you'd see all these different families getting intermarried. The kiln in Pottersville was just over 100 feet long, making it possible to produce very large quantities of pottery. The owners couldn't produce it alone and depended on slave labor to fill orders. One slave in particular became famous for his work, even in his time. Dave the Potter, you know, my personal hero. He uh, is, is very well educated, we believe, by the Landrums. So Dave could read and write at a time when he could have been punished but wasn't. Dave the Potter, or David Drake, was a slave born in Edgefield around 1801. He was well known for how large his pots and jugs were. Some could hold 40 gallons of liquid but he was best known for the words and poetry he inscribed on some of his pieces. Well, Dave was smart enough and educated enough and bold enough to write it onto a material that lasts, clay. Dave's poetry was written into the pots before they were fired. They were rhyming couplets about varied topics like the Bible, the size of the jar it was written on, and one about the buying and selling of his family members, which says, I wonder where is all my relations, friendship to all and every nation. Justin thinks it shows a bit of rebellious nature in Dave. But, but the weight of that, the constriction on Dave is what made him push back on that, that, uh, that weight that was in his life. And because of that, he became strong. Mm -hmm. And his strength is what is exhibited through these words on these great vessels that we have still today. Dave had several owners during his enslavement. One of them was Lewis Miles. One of the jugs with Dave's writing suggests a special relationship between the two men. Uh, the joke of which you mentioned, the uh, uh, LM says this handle will break, and it's written that right down the handle. So obviously the handle did not break, um, otherwise we wouldn't have that little, that little sparring, that verbal sparring between slave and owner, which is a very, very you know, unique window into that relationship. At some point in his life, Dave lost his leg. There are several theories on how it happened. One is that he passed out drunk with one leg on a train track and a train went over it. Another is that he suffered abuse at the hands of his owners that either caused or included the amputation of his leg. Both Justin and Tanya are hesitant to give these theories any weight because of the amount of respect Dave carried, even as a slave. But neither one of those stories is based in, in historical documents, and neither one of them really propels Dave in the light that I think he should be propelled in. I mean, I think he was a master craftsman, an amazing guy, exceedingly intelligent, exceedingly bold to do the things he did. I don't think these stories add to that story at all. It's most likely he lost it, like many people lost limbs then, you know, stepped on a rusty nail, uh, died, it, got it, lost a disease, um, you know, anything from, uh, well, I mean, it could be anything, diabetes, something of that nature. The work that Dave wrote on is being sold for tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of dollars, and one was recently sold for $1.5 million. Much of his work is in museums, including the Smithsonian. He is hailed as one of America's greatest African-American artists. 
There's no record of Dave's death, and it's not known where Dave, Dave the Potter Drake, is buried. We don't know when he dies, but in 1873, we know it says, you know, the, the one-legged Dave, the famous one-legged Dave, along with his jugs and his glory. So we know he's still well-known and celebrated, but he, he just goes kind of quiet. He just kind of drifts into that, um, you know, out of, out of public eye, so to speak. The most recent sale of Dave's work was purchased at auction for more than $1.5 million. Hey, Edgefield, that's just part of your hometown history. In Edgefield, Kim Vickers, WJBF, News Channel 6.